Uh, good morning, folks. Welcome to the uh, Denver Regional Council of Governments Regional Transportation Committee meeting for Tuesday, June 14, 2022. We are meeting virtually this month uh, due to the factors that were in your email, the, uh, uh, the high rates of, uh, of COVID in the metro counties. So thank you for your flexibility at the last minute change. I want to call the meeting to order. First thing I want to do is ask uh, if there are uh, any members of the public uh, who wish to offer public comment. Um, and if you do, uh, please raise your hand in the attendees list. Do we have an attendees list? Yeah, we do. I um, did not Chair, see. I did, I did uh, receive one public comment this morning via email. It is pretty long, so I will distribute it to the members and alternates uh, after the meeting. Okay. Uh, all right, please do that. Uh, let me go back to the agenda. Uh, the meeting summary is attached to your packet. Uh, does anybody have any questions on it? Any corrections or amendments? Raise your hand, I don't see any. Great, okay. We will move on then to uh, uh, the first action item, uh, which is a federal performance targets, uh, traffic congestion, on-road mobile sources, emissions, reduction and uh, Alvin Bidal Sanchez is going to uh, do that, correct? Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, I'm also gonna give a heads up to Josh and Cam. Um, if William Johnson pops on, can you please bring him over as a panelist? He'll be helping out with the presentation as well. Okay. Great, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Good morning, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, my item is the federal performance measures that we set. Uh, my name is Alvin Bidad Sanchez, transportation planner here at Dr. Cog. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I'll be discussing one of our five federal performance areas that we set through uh, federal legislation. So the one you all are probably most familiar with is PM1, safety. Um, but today we're gonna be talking about PM3. This is the most expansive of our performance areas. It's system performance, freight, and CMAC. Um, each of these comes with its own uh, reporting requirements, expectations on Dr. Cog, the data that gets used, and then depending on the performance area, we report either to the Federal Highway Administration or the Federal Transit Administration. Like I mentioned, uh, this is the most expansive of the performance areas. There are four different subparts. We're actually only talking about two of them today. Traffic congestion reduction, which looks at annual hours of peak hour excessive delay per capita, and the percent of non-single occupancy vehicle travel and then on-road mobile source emissions. Now, while there's really only one uh, performance measure, total emissions reduction, we set it for each of the different pollutants or precursors that were required to uh, comply with through the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. The remaining two, travel time reliability and freight reliability, we'll be bringing before you uh, later this year, early next year, after more coordination with CDOT to set those targets. This is the second time we're setting these targets. Uh, each covers a four year performance period. So 2022 through 2025. Um, we have already gone through our first performance period which covered 2018 through 2021. Um, a key piece here is that at the midpoint, so after 2023, we have the option to reevaluate our four year target. So we can see what the trend's looking like, how we're doing and see if we need to adjust the four year target that we've set for our area. One piece before I get into the presentation is just a reminder of 2020 data. So when uh, the one year ACS data first came out, the census was calling it experimental. They were cautioning against using that data to inform decisions, um, comparing directly to past years. So uh, throughout this exercise, uh, staff working with CDOT have uh, been trying to figure out how to handle the spikes, the dips that we saw throughout our data in 2020 as a result of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. I'm gonna start with our traffic congestion reduction performance measures. So again, non-single occupancy vehicle travel and peak hour excessive delay. We set these because as of October 1st of last year, we met all the criteria shown on your screen. We are a designated urbanized area. We have national highway system mileage. Our population is over 200,000 and we were in non-attainment or maintenance for ozone, CO and particulate matter. Uh, for those that remember an earlier presentation, we have fallen out of maintenance for, <clears throat> for CO. Uh, and we do expect to fall out of maintenance for particulate matter later in the year, but this is a determination based on where we were October 1st of last year. So while we are no longer in maintenance for CO, we do still have to set targets based on that determination as of last year. And then a key piece for the ones I'm discussing right now is that we set joint targets with CDOT. 
So when it comes time for adoption, both CDOT and Dr. Cog take the same action and adopt the same targets for our area. The area that these targets that are set for and the data we're using is specifically for the Denver Aurora, Colorado urbanized area. So that covers uh, multiple parts of the region, um, areas like Brighton, North Glen, Broomfield, over to Golden, and then down to Littleton, Parker, and Castle Rock. Um, it doesn't follow those jurisdictional boundaries exactly, but it does contain pieces of those communities. Um, one thing to note that it does not include the Boulder, Longmont, or Lafayette, Louisville, Erie urbanized areas. They don't meet the population threshold and they're their own separate urbanized areas. So when we're talking about the data that we're using and the targets we're setting, we're specifically looking at the area that's the Denver, Aurora, Colorado urbanized area. I've mentioned this is the second time we're setting these targets, so I wanted to provide a snapshot of what, how we did for the last round. A reminder again, there were two-year targets and four-year targets. Uh, reading this table from left to right, there's a desired trend we want to see from our baseline and to reach our targets. We have the targets that we actually set, what we saw in the data through our observations, and then the final column on the right is whether we met the target or we're better than the baseline. And that's a key piece when it comes time to see how we did for these and whether we're making progress in achieving these performance measures. Uh, the feds look at whether we met the target or we were at least better than the baseline. So in this case, our two-year observations were better than our uh, baseline and better than our two-year targets. So we did achieve progress in these two performance measures. Uh, a same table set up for the four-year targets. Again, left to right, our desired trend, our baseline, what our four-year targets were this time, and then what we saw in our data through four-year observations. Uh, for these as well, we were better than the baseline or we did meet the target. So green check marks across the board for these performance measures. An overview of the first performance measure <clears throat> is our percent of non-single occupancy vehicle travel. So again, it's our, the Denver Aurora urbanized area. We set two-year and four-year targets. And the data we're specifically looking at comes from the American Community Survey, five-year data, and how people are getting to work. So the performance measure is really simple, the percent of non-single occupancy vehicle travel occurring in the urbanized area. And the calculation is just 100% minus the percent that our single occupancy vehicle are driving alone to work. So under this non-SOV category, we include carpool, van pool, using public transportation, whether that's commuter rail, light rail, bus, people walking, biking, uh, and people working from home or telecommuting are also considered in our non-SOV category. As with all of our targets, uh, they're intended to be realistic and achievable because they are short-term. Uh, and again, Dr. Cog and CDOT set single unified targets for the region. So the proposed targets you'll see on the screen uh, are going to be um, have the same action taken by CDOT when it comes time. Now, Dr. Cog has a, a non-single occupancy vehicle target in MetroVision, 35% by 2040. We used the same methodology the first round we were setting these. Where were we? Where do we want to be? And what was the trend line we needed to see to get there by 2040? Staff are proposing the same methodology for this round as well. Um, because there was a spike in 2020 data as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are proposing to look at where we were back in 2019, um, mostly because across 2020, 2012 through 2019, um, there wasn't a lot of movement in this metric, uh, hovering around 24% across the urbanized area. And so uh, while there has been a bump as a result of the pandemic, because there it is five-year data and it is flattening that spike, we're proposing to see um, at the two-year mark, whether that trend is holding and whether we need to be more aggressive with our four-year target. So right now, our two-year target is 26.7, and our four-year target is 27.7 to help us achieve our MetroVision target of 35% by 2040. I'll provide an overview of peak hour excessive delay and then hand it over to CDOT so they can give their part of the presentation on this as well. Um, this is the same area, the Denver Aurora, Colorado urbanized area. We again set two-year and four-year targets. And the data that's used comes from the National Performance Management Research data set. Uh, the performance measure is annual hour of peak hour excessive delay per capita. And we're actually using a model that CDOT developed for forecasting out the targets. Um, as with the previous measure, targets should be realistic and achievable. And CDOT will set the same targets when it comes time as Dr. Cog does for the region. This is where I'll pass it over to either William or Jacob, whoever's on the line at the moment. Um, and I can run it from my side and just let me know when you want me to advance. Hey, Alvin, it's uh, William Johnson. Uh, I'm the Performance and Asset Management Branch Manager for CDOT. And uh, I'll be hitting on the CDOT portion of this presentation. Next slide, please. 
If you should have any questions, I am monitoring the chat and you can raise your hand. Some of this gets a little bit technical and I am gonna just fly through a lot of things at a, a very high level. Uh, so you could see here that for peak hour excessive delay, not everything is required to actually establish a target. Alvin hit the, the main points there is CDOT and Dr. Cog are required to establish a mutual target together, but it just covers the Denver or UZA. One of the most frequent questions we get on that is why doesn't it cover all of Dr. Cog? Well, that's not the requirement. And so we were sort of guided by the federal requirement and the requirement is just for that UZA. Next slide, please, Alvin. Now, just to peek out some of the data that we use to calculate peak hour excessive delay is we use something called the, the NPM RDS. It's the National Performance Measure, or sorry, Management Research Data Set. That is a standard data set used across the nation. We do have options to use other data sets. It does require certification. So for us to just you know keep consistency between not just CDOT, but all other states, we choose to use that data set. And you know, naturally it includes travel time, it includes posted speed limits, uh, it includes interval periods, and it also includes that UZA, that urban uh, urbanized area designation. Other information that we're using deals with ADT, that's your basic traffic volumes, and then occupancy factors. Another question that we're frequently asked is, hey, where do those occupancy factors come from? They're established by FHWA. We have to use those. Uh, we don't have an option to use any other ones. Next slide, please, Alvin. Now, when we had established our first round of uh, performance targets, one of the things that we found was that we were way off. And we used something that's called a linear regression model. And it, it's pretty simple as we just took the travel time for multiple periods and we looked at where is it trending towards. And using that trend, you're able to forecast out future trends. Now for us, what we found was that we were way wrong and it, it wasn't just a COVID thing, is we had a earlier identified after our two year mid evaluation period that we were off and that we weren't really taking into a factor other things besides just traffic and travel time. So some of the data that we use to establish forecasts this round is a little bit more complete, but also more complex. And you can see here, point data just refers to a, a specific place in Colorado. And we leveraged our travel demand model. We leveraged distances of travel. And then we had various weightings of things such as employment centers and students and where population centers are. Uh, population there is we did use county level population estimates, Colorado is does not grow in sort of a, an even fashion across the state. And so we leverage it down uh, a little bit further to optimize what that forecast would be. And then this thing here called Loveland Pass Transit data, well, freight travel is one of the big things that we were trying to include in there and the, the time it takes for freight to go from one point to another. Loveland was sort of our, our Loveland Pass was sort of our point area for capturing that information, all using remote sensing technology. Next slide, please, Alvin. Now, th this is just a, a slide here saying, hey, we considered all these things, linear regression didn't work for us, so what else was available? I think the bottom line here is to focus on two things. One is this decision tree. Uh, it's probably exactly what you think it is, is if one thing goes down and says yes or no, you go down to the next category and similar thing, yes or no. That is used to populate what is called a random forest. So two slides ago, I showed you all the things that sort of go into the forecast, the data, the population centers, the travel distance, the traffic, the vehicle occupancy, all those go down through a decision tree in a random forest to give us a very good estimate of what our, um, our future will be for peak hour excessive delay. Next slide, please, Alvin. That's just roughly articulating uh, what I said there. I, I try not to show this one too much because then I'll, I'll trip up uh, on my explanation. Uh, but bottom line is based on the, those different categories, 
Um, what you see there is exactly that, the yes or no. Uh, is it meeting this certain criteria? Criteria is sort of bound by data set. In this example, it's asking three years ago, was peak hour excessive delay greater than 15? Um, if yes, it goes down to the next data category. Now for this slide, the worst thing anybody could do is actually ask a question. So I'll give you a second to, to stare at it and then we'll go on to the next slide. Thanks, Alvin. Seeing those slides. This is what the random forest looks like. So going through those different iterations of the decision tree, you will eventually populate this random forest. It's an iterative model. So it goes through thousands of iterations of decision trees to populate the random forest. Um, and when the eventuality of this is you get a pretty complete prediction of what peak hour excessive delay will be. Now with this, the common question is asked, well, how do you know it's accurate? Well, it's because we tested it on previous data and it came out to be pretty close. And by pretty close, I mean, some of the instances were within one or 2% of what the actual results were. Uh, based on linear regression um, techniques, we, we were way off, I'd say, on orders of three or 400% in, in some of our runs. So using this methodology gets as much better accuracy in, in our, our forecast. Uh, next slide, please, Alvin. Now, uh, and, and I did come on late. I'm not sure if Alvin spoke a little bit about what the potential penalties will be if we miss the target. Uh, I wanna assure you they're not big. Uh, but it was worth it for us to go through and sort of figure out what is a more correct forecast. For us, is if the state misses the target, we have to write a report. And this report contains what are the things that we're going to put in place to course correct. If Dr. Cog should miss the target, um, there's really no penalty on it. Uh, but I would say that that doesn't necessarily, you know, leave you scot free on this is uh, at some point, I'm sure FHWA during your certification will ask, hey, can you explain why you missed the targets and what you're going to do to the course play? So it's a good thing that we're going through and, and sort of dialing in on these, these targets to make sure we're correct. Uh, I'd say if anything, it's because our last iteration of targets they weren't useful for us. The only thing that they were useful for was forecasting. What we're trying to do here is actually establish these targets with the purpose of affecting change. And so it was necessary for us to really dial in on accuracy and get these, you know, a little bit better shape. Now, what you're gonna see with these, uh, the slides that have the charts is three lines. Typically that middle line is where the forecast came in. The upper line, the orange one, and the green line represent an upper and lower threshold based off of a 95% confidence level. Uh, what this is, is essentially it's a cone of confidence. Given uncertainty, and I, I think, you know, we represent there with that, that very drastic downward turn in 2020 and the slow climb up in 2021, is we sort of have to look at what are these upper and lower thresholds and just using the best information we have, say how aggressive are we getting that, you know, quote unquote, return to normal. What I could say on the return to normal is that the latest estimates that I've seen for vehicle miles travel is that we are about 1% below where we were in 2019. Now what that's telling me is that I can make this big assumption that we are returning to some type of travel pattern that is closer to 2019 than 2020 or 2021 at a pretty rapid pace. Uh, but what I can't necessarily tell you at this point in time is whether or not that travel is occurring at the time periods that we're, or we're sort of bound to use for peak hour excessive delay. It does not cover the entire day it covers the, the um, peak hour. And uh, so everything is, is sort of measured against things outside of that peak hour. Anecdotally, I could tell you that, you know, driving to work in the morning, people are no longer going 300 miles per hour. And so there, there is quite a bit of congestion that I see on the road. So it leads me to believe anecdotally and just based on the data that we are returning to some normality. Now for this, um, you know, that two-year target, as Alvin had stated before, once we get there, that's our mid-evaluation period, we have the option to adjust based on data. At that point, I'd say we're going to look at it. We're going to use the same models. 
we'll have two more years of data to go off of. And if we find that we need to change the four-year target, we'll change the four-year target. Now for CDOT, if, if we're off on that two-year target, we still have to write a report. But again, the, the whole purpose for us is to make sure that we can use these targets to make a difference. So here's, here's what we're showing uh, for the, the Dr. Cog uh, peak hour excessive delay. It's the joint target for us where our two-year targets, 15.8, our, our four-year targets, 17.4. That's saying throughout the year, that's the amount of hours a, a driver will experience in peak hour excessive delay. I'll pause there, see if there's any questions. I know I went through a lot there. I'll go through the other sides pretty quick. Uh, all right, yes. um, Claire, Claire, Claire Levy, I believe, was first. Yeah, hold on. Uh, Claire Levy, go, go ahead. Okay, thanks. I, I'm happy to wait. I don't know who put their hand up first, but um, so I, I don't know if this question is for Bill or for Alvin Vidal, but how do you determine what is excessive delay? Right. Yeah, and, no, no. And, well, and then it's a, it's a two-part question always. Okay. Um, but the second part doesn't really relate to the first part, I'll confess. Um, I, I, I follow your presentation and I, would, I really would like to know what is considered excessive and, and what's, you know, because there must be a flip side, like that some amount of delay is normal and, and expected and tolerated. So what's excessive? But then I, I'm, I'm not tracking with what is the consequence of exceeding the target? How is this number actually used um, you know, in, in the work that Dr. Cog or CDOT does? Yeah, you, you were the quickest person on the button. Uh, and so let me work your question backward. I'll start with your last question first. Uh, consequences equal the penalty. And I went quickly through what the penalty is if we, we just blow the target that our excessive delay is, let's say for that two year, is 20. Uh, what that means for Colorado DOT is that we have to write a report to FHWA that details, here are our action steps to rectify why we missed the target. And so for us, we could look at what those action steps are, our strategies, strategies to reduce congestion. And you know, a couple simple ones, uh, would be, you know, we want to get more people in cars, more people on transit. Uh, so CDOT has Pegasus. We have busting. We would want to increase ridership, especially during those peak hours. Uh, and, you know, other strategies that we would use are ITS, ops, is ensure that we are deploying courtesy patrol to incidents to remove traffic from non-recurring congestion as quickly as possible uh, to ensure that there's no debris on, on the road that would slow traffic to use things like ramp metering, especially in Denver, so that it's you know increasing ease of flow onto the highway. Um, Alvin, did, did you have a good mix of, of the types of things that you would do at Dr. Cog? I, I imagine they're very similar to, to what you do at CDOT. Yeah, I was going to touch on um, one way we bring this into our other planning work is through our transportation improvement program. Um, we do uh, catalog code projects on whether we think that they're going to improve uh, all of these different metrics. So um, if you were to go into our TRIPS database, you could see what measures that we think this project is going to help us achieve our targets in. So um, for each of them, we do have a, a category of projects now that we look at. So uh, we're not just saying all projects are improving all aspects of performance measures. We do specifically look at some particular project types that we think could improve peak hour excessive delay, could improve non-seeing occupancy vehicle travel. And then for our other metrics as well, what can improve pavement condition, what projects are gonna improve safety in the region. So that's one way we do bring it into our planning work um, is cataloging those projects in, in our TRIPS database. So, um, you know, I, I, I keep harping on, we really are, are focused on dialing in on our targets because we want to use this information. Um, I, I got to tell you that, you know, besides just getting this aggregate uh, to and for your target, it is much more detail in that information down to specific segments on the roadway. So, you know, we can really look at things surgically if we need to. Um, I'm going to give credit to Jacob. He's whispering virtually in my ear to answer your first question. What is 
peak hour excessive delay. How is that established? Well, you know, first and foremost, it's very prescriptive. It's prescribed by FHWA uh, through, through rules. And so it's required that DOTs report a certain way using a certain data set um, and you know, using very similar other data sets to establish that. Uh, I have here the threshold for excessive delay is based on travel time at 20 miles per hour or 60% of the posted speed limit uh, travel time, uh, whichever is greater and will be measured in 15 minute intervals. Now for the, the Dr. Cog area, that's six to 10 a.m and 3 to 7 p.m. Okay. Good. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, because it's a, for me, it was a qualitative a question about whether that is qualitative and, and can we uh, change the target? Oh, yeah, or, I mean, can we change the definition of what is excessive delay if violating it would mean, say, capacity expansion, which we want to avoid. And we say, okay, so, you know, we, we think that, um, you know, the baseline of 11.7 hours is um, too low and we would raise that so, to avoid triggering these things. But it sounds like we don't have that degree of control. Is that right? That, that is correct. We, we don't. Okay, thanks. Thanks. I, I believe uh, Kate Williams was the next hand up. Yeah, uh, Director Williams, uh, you're up. Go ahead. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I, this is good work. I know there's a lot of work that everybody put into it. It, it just is um, almost irrelevant to our, our lives these days when we are working at looking at reducing single occupancy vehicles and sparing our, our air and there isn't any indication here that says our air quality gets better or worse at 20 miles an hour as opposed to 40 miles an hour. Um, we have tied this to our efforts to reduce single occupancy vehicles. I just, I, I get that we have to do this, that we are, we being the area, Dr. Cog and CDOT are required to report on this kind of stuff, but it's so outdated almost, that I would love to see you guys tie it back into some of the other work that's going on. Um, that's all, sorry, thanks. Yeah, and ex please excuse me if I, I miss your titles, Director Williams, I don't have that information in front of me. Um, here, here's just a quick response. This is one performance measure out of many. And I think that included in this presentation, Alvin has other performance measures that we'll quickly discuss that do sort of hit on your point about things like air quality. And you know, when we get to that, I, I hope we get a satisfactory response to, hey, what, what are we doing about that air quality you know, besides just focusing on peak hour excessive delay? I also want to assure you that, at least on CDOT's part, and I'm aware of Dr. Cog through, through your regional plan, is we do have a, a whole other subset of performance measures that align with the, the, the federal performance measures, but also that we look at from the part of CDOT in making sure that we're making the correct decisions and tr tracking the correct things on the state that lead towards things like better air quality. Uh, reduce congestion. So these are things that are just required by FHWA. And we, we don't really have a choice uh, or say in saying, hey, these are antiquated, but we do have a choice in those other performance measures. Okay, just a quickie, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so at RTD, we have seen a lot of statistics that show that the travel patterns have changed since COVID and, and remain changed. We, we don't see those peak rush hours nearly as much. We actually um, have a new model that's called the camel model where stuff goes up in the middle of the day. And I see that these are all reflected. I think you said it's seven to 10 or in three to six, whatever. Um, and those, what we see in, in the local region are that those hours of rush hour are changing. So I, I just hope that you all are looking at that as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely we do. Again, that's six to 10 and, and three to 7 p.m. We don't have a choice on those. Those are the time periods that are given to us by FHWA. 
Um, you know, my, my anecdote about people no longer driving 300 miles per hour. Well, I'm, I'm not exactly on the road at, you know, what, 1, 1 p.m. <laughs> looking at, at traffic. But I, I know that there is a lunchtime rush. And it's one of the things that I speculate is, yeah, VMT is probably returning to normalish. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people are traveling at the same time. Uh, I would say that if you're working at home, you're probably making that grocery store run between 11 and, and two o'clock. <laughs> and that, that's where, where everybody, I know that I, I, I hope my boss isn't in there. I know I've been to Costco on a Wednesday at two o'clock and that Costco is packed. Uh, so yeah, there, I, I agree that there is some change in travel. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Silverstein, uh, you're up. Yes, hello and, and good morning. Please excuse my voice today. Um, just a quick question on, on the data. This is all really um, great stuff and it aligns well with the work we do at the, at the Regional Air Quality Council. Could you um, let me know if you can break any of these um, data points up um, by month? We're presenting things on an annual basis, but I'm super interested in the summertime travel since that's really the focus of our air quality efforts. So that's a simple question. Thank you. Uh, the the answer is is yes, um, and you know what I'll say is I, I know Jacob is listening on Jacob. If we could take a note, and we'll we'll sort of sort out how we distribute that information to you. Thank you, uh, Director Shaw. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, this question may actually be for Alvin. Um, in terms of the Denver Aurora UZA, I noticed that in particular, City of Lone Tree and City of Castle Pines are both missing from the list. Is this list simply representative? No, the list of uh, communities isn't representative. It was just intended to give you an idea of the geographic area that's covered by the urbanized area. So it's okay, not, uh, so it's not inclusive of all jurisdictions within it. Got it. Okay. So uh, it looked like there was a kind of a gouge out of the map at that point, but I wasn't sure if that was us. <laughs> yeah, um, there's a little uh, little anchor down into the parts of the castle rock community. So it doesn't follow jurisdictional boundaries exactly, just because it is a census urbanized area, but it does include pieces of those communities that were shown on that slide. Great, thank you. And one other question about the random forest. Is it kind of uh, the responses that you average, is that like a weighted average similar to the Monte Carlo simulation in financial services or uh, how, it's great that you're accurate. So whatever you're doing is right, I was just Curious. Yeah, no, it's um, not not all of the data elements are weighted. Uh, it's it's more that we establish parameters around them, and those parameters are based on either uh, growth, say population, uh, where it, it will take more of an effect, but it depends upon which year. So I could tell you that things like distance and uh, population have a greater effect on the four-year target as opposed to the two-year target, which is driven more by the previous three years of peak hour excessive delay in AADT. Great, it, thank you. It, uh, yeah, as opposed to waiting, it's really greatest effect. Thank you. Okay, ne next slide, please, Alvin. Really appreciate all the questions. Haven't had this many questions on this in a while. Thank you all. I appreciate you jumping on to help with the presentation. Uh, so on your screen is a uh, recreation of CDOT slide. Again, our two-year target is 15.8 and our four-year target is 17.4. Uh, we do think these are conservative uh, on the upper end, so we can capture any uh, issues there might be in the model um, if return to normal is quicker than we expect. And at the two-year mark, we do have the option of changing our four-year target if we do see that um, we're higher or lower than we are expecting to be based on what we're seeing then. So just a summary slide, um, again, a similar table setup, desired trend we wanna see in that performance measure, the baseline that we're working with, with our new performance period, and then our proposed two-year and our four-year targets. So again, we can reevaluate 
at the two-year mark. And we can see uh, across both of these, whether we see non-SOV trips or delay returning to pre-pandemic levels quicker, um, or whether that trend from 2020, 2021 is staying more permanent. I'm gonna shift us over to the second performance uh, subpart we were looking at today on road mobile source emissions reduction. So on this one, um, again, I'll show you where we were with our previous performance period. Again, two-year and four-year targets. The table set up the same way with the trend we wanna see across all of these. We do wanna be higher because it is emissions reduction benefit. Uh, the baseline was the previous four-year period and then our adopted two-year targets and then our two-year observations. Across each of these, our observations were higher than our targets and higher than our baseline. So you're seeing a green check mark on your screen that we did meet our target for our two-year targets across each of these different uh, pollutants and precursors. When it comes to the four-year period, um, again, green check marks across the screen. For those uh, eagle-eyed observers, you might notice on the second slide, second row for total emissions reduction, PM10, our four-year observation was 41.385. That's obviously lower than our target of 152. But again, remember part of the um, achievement report is whether we're better than the baseline. So 41.385 is higher than 40.714. So we can still say we are making progress in this performance measure. So green check marks across the board for our two-year and four-year targets when it comes to our different pollutants and precursors that we're setting targets for. Uh, state DOTs and MPOs that have uh, non-attainment or maintenance areas are required to set these targets. So CDOT, Dr. Cog, and the North Front Range MPO are currently going through this exercise. The data is what's reported to CMAC, the CMAC public access system. That's something everyone has access to. If you so chose, you could go to it uh, and run your own reports for specific states, MPOs, uh, specific years to see how we're doing uh, with this um, emission reduction benefit. The performance measure, again, is total emissions reduction, but it's for each pollutant that the area is uh, required to set targets for. So for Dr. Cog, that's nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, carbon monoxide, and particulate matter. The calculation is also really simple. You're adding up the two-year and the four-year reductions that have been reported for CMAQ-funded projects. And as with the other federal targets, because they are short-term, they're intended to be realistic and achievable. Uh, and this is another unique piece that uh, Dr. Cog has to set our own targets for the region. So we're not um, setting single unified targets with CDOT. We're not supporting the state's targets by adopting their targets. We're setting our own for our area. Um, I'm gonna run through a number of considerations that staff took uh, while they were while we were developing these targets with CDOT. Um, there are quite a few, so I do wanna run through them just so you understand what was foundational to our methodology that we ultimately chose. Um, but one key piece is that the benefits are only recorded from CMAC funded projects. So if you have a bike ped project using transportation alternatives funding, if you have a transit operations project using MMOF, um, when it comes time to plug in carbon reduction program funding, um, any emission reduction benefits that you're achieving through those projects with those funds don't count towards this target. So we're only looking at projects that are CMAC funded and the reductions that are recorded from those specific projects with that specific funding type. Uh, benefits are only reported once and it's when the project is first obligated. So not when the project is complete, not when it opens for traffic, not when your outreach program is done and you've uh, implemented it. It's when the project is first obligated. So uh, when it is the project sponsor eligible to start getting reimbursed for those project expenses. So if there's a delay to when you think you're going to be receiving that obligation, that can uh, mess with our forecast. And then emission reduction benefits for ongoing projects. So if you have a project that's longer than a year, longer than five years, 10 years, we're only recording benefits that one time, and it's that first time that the project is obligated, not throughout the life of the project for these targets. As y'all are very well aware, we're in the middle of multiple calls for projects. So we're unable to forecast what those potential reduction benefits might be. Uh, and that's partly because emission reduction benefits, improving air quality is only one consideration when staff are scoring projects and panels are recommending projects to the board. Uh, and another key piece is funding type is assigned uh, on the back end to figure out what funding is available, what's eligible for specific projects. And so it could be combined with other funding. And we're not sure what that ultimate exercise will look like after we've gone through these four calls for projects. Uh, our tip also includes set-asides. So those are the set-aside fundings that, uh, that go through their own um, solicitation evaluation process. We're not aware of those projects and those CMAC funded projects until it's time to actually report at the end of every fiscal year. So there's a whole batch of projects that staff aren't aware of until the reporting period ends. 
I'd mentioned this earlier, but our carbon monoxide maintenance period has ended. We do expect our particulate matter maintenance period to end later this year. So we're no longer gonna have to set targets for those pollutants, but because the applicability determination was where we were last year, we do still have to set them, but we recognize that we won't in the future. I'm um, working with CDOT and the data that they have for the baseline period, we found out that Dr. Cog's projects account for roughly 74% of the state's CMAC projects and roughly 80% of the state's emission reduction benefits over the previous four years. And then we did wanna also uh, mention that uh, we do have a MetroVision target related to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, just respect that we do have a, a long range aspirational target uh, associated with air quality but through our methodologies that we're going to show you and that we're proposing for our targets, we are proposing to keep those separate. So I'm going to run through a number of slides just to show you where we were with the data, uh, the different methodologies we used to set, evaluate what scenario we could use for setting targets and what we ultimately ended up with. Um, on your screen right now are four charts showing uh, historical emissions reduction benefits recorded from fiscal years 2014 through 2021. Uh, the point here is that across each of these different pollutants or precursors, there's no real trend. There are spikes in the data, specifically you can see in 2017, 2021. Um, there are dips. If you look at particulate matter in 2020, we only recorded 0.153. So across each of these years, across each of these pollutants, there's no real trend. There's no real uh, increase or decrease across them because it is tied to an obligation of a project and not the construction or implementation of a project. So one of the first scenarios we looked at was, let's just look at our baseline period and see what was the lowest emission reduction benefit we saw at that point. And um, can we replicate that over the next four years? So for this scenario, the target, the two-year target would have been the values highlighted on your screen times two, and the four-year target would have been those values times four. And so um, really easy to understand, what was your lowest value? Multiply times two, multiply times four. Um, a con obviously being that we're setting a floor that we're just wanting to achieve over the next four years um, and potentially looking at a minimum achievement. The second scenario we looked at was taking an average. So using all eight years of baseline data that we do have, can we see what the average across each of these different pollutants was? So now on your screen are the eight year averages for each pollutant or each precursor. Um, the two year target would have been that value times two and the four year target would have been that value times four. Again, relatively simple. What's the eight year average and then multiply times two or times four to get the two year target and the four year target respectively. Um, this one does get a little aggressive, especially with the volatile organic compounds and carbon monoxide. We're taking into account those uh, spikes in the data in 2017, 2021. So we end up getting very aggressive uh, for your targets at the end of the period that are we're unlikely to achieve over the performance period. And then the last scenario we looked at was uh, based on CDOT's own methodology that they developed for their statewide targets, um, establishing a benefits per dollar. So they took their uh, previous four-year baseline data uh, and looked at how much CMAC funding was obligated. Um, we did the same. So for the Dr. Cog region, how much CMAC dollars were obligated in each of these fiscal years for projects? Those numbers are now on your screen. So 30 million in 2018, 14 million in 2019, 19 million in 2020, and 30 million in 2021. Uh, you can see even in years where there's relatively similar obligation, uh, 30 million in 2018, 2021, you're still seeing very different uh, benefit reductions in those years. So even if we do take this methodology um, and establish a benefit per dollar, uh, we would get very aggressive targets um, just based on uh, we're more efficient in some years, we're more efficient in particular pollutants than CDOT is. So we would actually be setting targets that are higher than the state for some of these. A summary slide of each of those different scenarios, specifically looking at the four-year targets and the baseline. Um, for each of the pollutants, we start with our baseline that we saw the last four fiscal years. And then on your screen, moving left to right, are the four-year targets for each of those different scenarios. And as you move left to right, you see them get progressively more aggressive, uh, more unlikely to achieve, and in some cases, actually doubling what we even saw in the previous four years. And so um, recognizing that we are... Uh, a vast majority of the state's CMAC projects and emission reduction benefits. Um, and respecting that we do have that Metro Vision target, our proposal is to take our portion of the state's targets uh, for each pollutant. So for uh, each different pollutant, Dr. Cog over the last four years has contributed a different percentage to the state's baseline. 
Um, that's 86% for volatile organic compounds, 66% for PM10, 95% for CO, and 73% for nitrogen oxides. Our proposal is we look at what CDOT's two-year targets are for that period, and we take our portion of that and commit to achieving our piece of the state's targets for our particular pollutants, recognizing the percentage we've contributed over the previous four years to each of these. So our two-year target would be 243 times 86 and so on down for each of those rows for each pollutant over the next two years. Our four-year methodology would follow that same, um, that same scheme. So our portion of each of these different pollutants compared to the state targets, looking at the state's four-year targets across the full period and then making our contribution to the states. So uh, our summary slide, um, our two-year targets and our four-year targets, we would like to see uh, higher values than what's in the baseline and what's our targets that are being proposed. As with our other ones, we can reevaluate the four-year target at the two-year mark. And at that point, we'll also have a better understanding of what projects are in the tip with CMAC funding. So we can have a better understanding of when a project might obligate um, and what the emission reduction benefits might be for a project. So we can see how we're doing at that two-year mark uh, and reevaluate that four-year target. The TAC recommended approval at their May meeting or before you right now, uh, and we'll be going before the board tomorrow. Uh, even after the uh, approval and adoption of targets, we do still have reporting requirements. We have a performance plan due to CDOT on September 1st. So that includes where we are at the baseline. So all those different columns you were seeing that uh, specify where we were at our baseline level. We're gonna describe any progress we've made in achieving performance targets and include a description of projects that we've identified that have funding and that could help achieve the different emission and traffic reduction targets that we have established. Um, we expect this year to be a busy year for our federal performance measures. We're coming before you with a piece of PM3. So that green circle on your screen, um, we've already taken care of our PM1 safety targets. Uh, but later in the year, early next year, we do expect to come before you with PM2 infrastructure condition targets, the rest of PM3, and then with future coordination with RTD of some potential changes to the Public Transportation Agency safety plan targets that are established. So a summary slide for transparency that's also included in the memo uh, and will be included in any future resolution for on board action are the two-year targets and the four-year targets that staff are proposing um, compared to their baseline value as well as their trend. And I would note on this slide, our requested motion is a little different than what was included in the memo packet uh, and the previous presentation. Um, it now does include a new geography just to make sure we're capturing all of those appropriately and reflecting our requirements for federal performance-based planning and programming. So our requested motion on the screen to open up for further discussion is to move to recommend to the Board of Directors the traffic congestion reduction and on-road mobile source emissions reduction targets for the Denver, Aurora, Colorado urbanized area and the Denver Regional Council of Governments as part of federal performance-based planning and programming requirements. Thank you, Alvin and Bill. Uh, just quickly before I go to uh, Director Silverstein, the addition of that last part in the requested motion from what we were sent uh, last week, explain the significance of that. Uh, it's, to match, oh, it's, it's to match uh, what we changed for the board since uh, both RTC and board do need to make similar actions. Um, but we are including now the Denver Regional Council governments just to reflect that our CMAC projects are for the planning area of Dr. Cog, not just the Denver Aurora Colorado urbanized area, that geography is specific to non-SOV and peak hour excessive delay. Uh, and okay. then we did just want to reflect that we're doing this action as part of our requirements through federal legislation that comes out of federal highway and FTA expectations. Okay. That's not in conflict in any way with what went through the TAC uh, last month. No, just RTC and board need to have the same actions. Okay. Um, and TAC has recommended approval of the target. So it, slightly different okay. wording under the motion, but just RTC and the board. All have right. the same I wording. just want to make sure it was consistent. Thank you. Uh, Director Silverstein, uh, you've had your hand up a long time and I've waited to call on you to the end of the presentation. So I hope uh, I hope you are okay. Go ahead. Uh, if, if I can remember my question now, it's uh, <laughs> such excellent work here. And um, just wanted to make a statement first that um, all of this really, again, feeds into the work at the, at the Regional Air Quality Council and, and the um, analysis that you all do for the, uh, the benefits of the CMAC projects really do make a difference. And that helps us in our planning work. And um, we work so closely um, as, as teams that, um, you know, I, I'm just always surprised at how much goes on behind the scene to, to help feed in, you know, the, to the policy conversation 
So thank you, um, Dr. Cog and Seahawks staff for all the great work. And the one um, maybe comment I have that's in addition or the more focused when my hand went up was you mentioned a few times in the presentation that you know we're moving into the attainment status for carbon monoxide and then um, shortly for a particulate matter. And um, we just need to be a little cautious there because um, although we're ending the 20 years of maintenance, um, we still have to submit a request to EPA to redesignate us to attainment. So that's probably something behind, those, behind the scenes of the weeds, but we may still be in this maintenance status for some time until we actually request the redesignation and EPA approves that and gosh, that takes years. So, um, but yeah, congrats for the 20 years of maintenance and all the work and conformity and all of these projects. So just the clarifying point and thank you. Thank you, I thank appreciate you. that point. Um, Chair, I would just also note uh, that to your mark when we do have the option to evaluate our four-year targets, um, we can also, the federal government will also be checking where we are with those different precursors and pollutants. So wherever we are through that process to um, reclassify ourselves, if we're still, uh, as was noted in maintenance officially, we will still be setting those targets for those pollutants. Um, so a good clarifying point, thank you. Well, the director said it could take years. Uh, how long are we looking at to get EPA uh, to uh, officially act? Have we applied? Um, the, that really is a question you know, for the Regional Air Quality Council and especially right. Through the Air Commission, and know that that hasn't happened. So that's in our work plan to begin that effort next year for carbon monoxide, and, and shortly, and hopefully, in for PM, you know, within next year or the year after. So it has to go through a, a state process first, and um, so 2023 over to EPA in 2024, and um, hopefully, quick action then. So that's that would be the shortest possible time frame. Thank you. I love how you call that quick action. <laughs> quick action. Man. It's, it's all relative. Right. <laughs> Will you. all the people on this screen be alive when we get to that point? Uh, thank you. We just don't want to go out of compliance while we're in the process of, or out of maintenance while we're in the process of. Yeah, not a chance. We're good. Uh, uh, Director Levy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I have two questions. The first is just how these um, targets relate to the motor vehicle emission targets in the ozone um, SIP and whether, yeah, whether they're consistent with that. So these are the same pollutants that are used in uh, our air quality conformity modeling. Um, but a key piece of this is that these are just looking at projects that are funded with CMAC dollars. Uh, and so um, through that air quality modeling, um, and when we're doing that exercise, we're looking at um, just do our modeling and our forecast, uh, what we're seeing across the board, not specifically projects funded with CMAC. So that's a key piece of these targets is uh, when we're looking at the reduction benefits, we're only looking at um, projects funded with CMAC dollars, and we're only recording them once when they're first obligated. So it's emission reduction benefits reported, not actually achieved. So uh, not what we're seeing in our modeling or our forecasting. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, okay. So this is just such a small component of that total budget, okay. But, and then the, the, I, the second question really, I guess just is um, me being baffled about how to understand these emission reduction targets. And I'm looking at page 37 of the presentation where you have the proposed emission reduction performance targets. And what's got me puzzled is that, that the two-year target is so out of whack with um, with the four-year target and the baseline. So we like just taking PM10. So the baseline is 41 point something um, kilograms per day. And we have a, so that the 23.9 is a targeted amount to reduce PM10 emissions. I, I guess I, I don't understand why there's such a big disparity between the two-year target and the four-year target. Yep. Um, so the two-year target is just going to be, oh, sorry, let me change how I'm showing myself. Um, the two-year target will be the emissions reduction benefits reported for 2022 and 2023 added up. So um, it's just two years worth of data that we're looking at for our two-year target. So that's why you're seeing a half value oh, okay. essentially. So it's added to, yep. okay. Um, and then the four-year target will be inclusive of that 2022, 2023 with the additional 24, okay. 25 fiscal year reported data. Okay, 
Thank you. I knew Thank that you. had to be a simple answer. Is that it? Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Director Levy. Uh, Alvin, could you put the proposed motion back up on the screen? And let me ask if there are, uh, Director Shaw. Thank you. I would like to propose uh, the motion. I move to recommend to the Board of Directors the traffic congestion reduction and on-road mobile source emissions <coughs> reduction targets for the Denver Aurora Colorado urbanized area and the Denver Regional Council of Governments as part of federal performance-based planning and programming requirements. Do we have a second? Second, Director Williams. Thank you, Director Williams. Uh, do we have any further discussion on the motion? Raise your hand if you do. Seeing none, let me call for the vote. All those in favor, uh, let, let's do a voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Hearing none, are there any abstentions? Hearing none, uh, the motion is approved and we'll go to the board uh, tomorrow evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you, Bill. Uh, next up, uh, let me get the agenda back on the screen, is uh, I think Jacob uh, with a presentation informational item on the Greenhouse Gas 2050 update. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, good, certainly. good morning, Go everyone. Okay, hopefully you're seeing that in presentation mode. Um, so, thank you. yeah, thank you. So I'm going to seize the mantle here. This is the only time I think I can say this in this planning process. This is not the most complicated presentation you're going to receive today. Every other meeting, it probably will be. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's dive into it. These first three points really are just for review. You've heard me say these things before, mm -hmm. uh, but just as a quick reminder from the state greenhouse gas rule, the deadline in the rule is October 1st. Um, by that time, the Dr. Cog board needs to adopt a revised 2050 regional transportation plan and associated documentation that addresses the requirements of the state GHG rule. We've talked before about uh, the baseline, how the rule defines the baseline, the plan as it was adopted back in 2021 and as it was modeled at the time of adoption. And we've also said that the emission reduction target amounts that are specified in the rule are from the baseline. So from there, um, and let me move something on my screen here. Second, thank you. Um, the, um, the adopted 2050 RTP, uh, we think can achieve about 70 to 80% of the reduction targets that are specified by the rule with some of the things that we've talked about in previous meetings, um, in particular telework adjustments, quantifying programmatic investments in the plan, um, and some of the other initial strategies that we've been looking at over the past several months. So we're currently doing several things. One of the things that we're currently doing is testing what we call um, kind of strategic surgical strikes to um, the 2050 RTP's fiscally constrained project investment mix. Um, and I'll talk more about that in this presentation. But even when we do that, um, we do still have a reduction gap. So I want to be honest about that. And then two additional concepts that we're looking at that I will touch on today, um, near-term land use forecast adjustments and mitigation measures that are provided by the rule. Um, for both of these topics, I will note that we gave a more detailed briefing to our transportation advisory committee yesterday in a work session, and the Dr. Cog board will receive that same briefing on these two topics tomorrow night. So there is a presentation in a packet floating around with more detail um, on those concepts that we'll talk more about with our board uh, tomorrow night. Um, we wanted to give some structure and some framework to this, what we acknowledge is a very complicated, um, confusing process with the GHG rules. So we try to kind of lay out um, sort of the major process and workflow um, of what we've been doing to respond to the rule. So we've spent a lot of time, and I'll show you this at the end of the presentation as well, um, after the context of the content of this presentation. Um, but we've talked a lot about number one, about the baseline, how it's defined, uh, what is our baseline. Uh, we've talked about step two, uh, which is reflecting all the investments in the plan. And these are additive, they kind of build on each other. Um, so these are cumulative. Um, so first we define our baseline, then we started with those initial strategies to see how far uh, we get towards meeting the emission reduction targets. So we're now in step three, talking about changes to the plan's project mix, and we're testing those um, on the sort of technical side. Um, and then step four, we'll also touch on today, as I said, both the near-term land use adjustments, uh, net land use forecast adjustments, and mitigation measures. Um, so you, I think you've seen this table before. This comes directly from the rule. These are the emission reduction target amounts that are specified in the rule. They are by geography. <clears throat> 
excuse me, for Dr. Cog, they are for our MPO area. So they are our urban counties. They include the entire Dr. Cog area, except Clear Creek and Gilpin counties and Adamson and Rapaho, east of Kiowa Creek. Everything else is sort of our urban area, our MPO area, and that's what the target applies to. The other MPOs in the state have their own targets. And then CDOT is also doing this as well. They have their own targets for the non-MPO areas of the state. So primarily the rural areas of the state. Um, so um, based on the baseline, <clears throat> which we have calculated, that's the first row in this table. Um, again, the plan is adopted and modeled at the time of adoption. Um, that's the first row. We calculate the baseline for each of the analysis years um, that are required by the rule. So that's the 14.64, the 9.23, et cetera. Um, again, all of this is a million metric tons. Um, that's the measurement uh, specified in the rule. And then the reduction target amounts are what I just showed you on the previous slide, the 0.27, the 0.82, um, again, million metric tons by analysis year. So once you know your baseline <clears throat> and once you know the reduction amount, um, then we calculate the percent reduction required from the baseline. As you see, it's about 1.8% for 2025, 8.9% for 2030, which I will say is turning out right now to be our most difficult um, year to meet in terms of meeting the target. And then 2040 and 2050 are about roughly 10% uh, reduction for each of those two analysis years. Um, so I won't dwell on this either. We've talked about this in previous meetings, but just a reminder of the point that <clears throat> one of the big strategies and one of the initial things that we've spent quite a bit of time on is remember the baseline is the plan as modeled at the time of adoption. And typically when we model the plan, particularly for our federal requirements of air quality conformity, we're including the major projects, what I call the lines or the dots on the map, um, the major multimodal projects that are in the plan, listed in table 3.1 of the plan. We include those in our modeling. What we haven't typically included in the past though, is the non-project specific programmatic investments. These are things like intersection operations, maintenance, sidewalks, um, bike pads, you know, all those sorts of things that um, what I call the connective tissue of our multimodal transportation system. Really important part of our plan, really important and significant part of our financial plan in our fiscally constrained plan. But again, because they're non-project specific over a 30 year transportation plan, we have not typically included those in our modeling. So a big part of our analysis has been to kind of go back and really understand, you know, all of these very important investments in our transportation system that are non-project specific and to try and quantify uh, the GHG emission reduction benefits of these investments. I also want to acknowledge the work of our civic advisory group. Um, this is one of two groups that we formed when we first prepared the 2015 regional transportation plan. Um, we've resurrected the civic advisory group to work with us through this process as well. Um, this is a group that includes either sort of direct populations or folks who work with populations that are uh, vulnerable populations in our region, traditionally underrepresented in our transportation planning process. Um, we wanted to hear their voices and get them involved um, in our planning process. So we have met with them two or three times now um, through this work and we'll continue to meet with them about on a monthly basis um, through the course of this GHD planning work. Um, so I mentioned this because we did an exercise with them back in mid-May. Um, last time we met with them on these programmatic investments, we did kind of a before and after, not quite a budget game. It was more just kind of a voting exercise, but we wanted to understand from them, you know, sort of when we think about programmatic investments in the plan, and particularly one of the things that we're trying to do is actually increase programmatic investments um, because it is an effective GHG emission reduction strategy. We wanted to hear from this group sort of, um, you know, their, their perspective and their ideas and their preferences around uh, programmatic investments. So we did a before and after um, kind of voting exercise. You see the results are very similar. I think the big takeaway that we got from this group in this exercise um, was that they understand the importance of all of these things. They support all of these things from a GHG emission reduction perspective. But for them, it was also about building community. They were, they were really interested in these investments that you know, really help tangibly kind of benefit um, and build up their communities. And that was important information for us to hear. So, um, you know, we put all of that together. As I said, we're about 70 to 80% of the way there. Um, we know that programmatic strategies alone and the other strategies that we've tested so far uh, will not achieve the GHG targets. So we are testing um, on the technical analysis side, the modeling side, we are testing what we call targeted changes to the RTP's projects and investment mix. 
And there's some concepts that we're looking at here. One is to a little bit refocus the scope of some of the capacity projects. And this is really in the spirit of the rule um, to emphasize complete streets and safety retrofits as part of those projects. So, you know, the projects in the plan are important, but we're trying to look at some of them and say, you know, can we tackle the issues that those projects are trying to address from a slightly different way that's more compatible with the GHD rule and can help, um, you know, help in terms of GHD reduction benefits. As you may recall in the plan, we defined a very robust um, BRT network, bus rapid transit network, um, based on the um, NAMS work and RTD's regional BRT study. Uh, we defined a network of approximately 10 to 12 distinct BRT corridors to implement. Over the 30 years of the plan, the idea was to try and implement a BRT corridor roughly every five years or so. Um, over the course of the 30 years of the 2050 plan. One of the things we're looking at is can we advance some of those corridors, um, actually find a way to do them sooner and capture the GHG emission reduction benefits of doing so sooner. And then I alluded to this, we also want to increase investment in multimodal improvements and some of the programmatic investments. We're actually trying to free up um, some dollars in our fiscally constrained plan, in our financial plan, um, so that we can do more programmatic investment. The idea is that we do more of that investment and we do it more quickly. Um, again, some of the categories that we already talked about, active transportation, safety, complete streets, retrofits, transit, um, if we can make more of those investments and do them sooner, and again, capture the GHG benefits of doing so sooner is a big thing that we're looking at as well. However, I want to be, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to be transparent with that group. Even if we do all of the things that I've just talked about on this slide, um, even all of those things will not completely close the GHG gap. So that leads us to two more things. Um, again, this leads to the briefing that we gave our Transportation Advisory Committee yesterday, um, and that at least the Dr. Cog Board will get a briefing on tomorrow night, um, but I want to touch on them here. The first thing is near-term land use forecast adjustments. I want to be clear, this is not a strategy to reduce GHG emissions. It really affects more our baseline of where we're starting from. But the idea here is we've gone through all our technical analysis over the last several months is that we realize we've observed that the world is developing a little bit different than we originally forecast in our land use forecast when we originally prepared um, the 2050 regional transportation plan. Um, in particular, housing construction, housing density um, is developing a little bit higher density um, than we originally forecast. And so if we can see in the real world results that are different, you know, we actually want to update our forecasts um, and include that in our forecast. Um, so we're working to see if we can do that right now. Um, the result of doing that, though, may be that it may help us shrink um, the GHG emission reduction gap. Um, but we're really doing this to sort of update our near-term land use forecasts um, and use that as part of our baseline as part of this work in the GHG analysis. The other thing that we're looking at is uh, mitigation measures. Uh, which are provided for, they're defined in the GHG rule, and they've been further defined in um, the Transportation Commission's recently adopted Policy Directive 1610. Um, these are separate from our modeling, our traffic modeling, and our focus model. These are mitigation measures. They cover a, a variety of, of uh, topics, um, but these are specific things that are defined in Policy Directive 1610. Um, as I think many of you know, um, these are things that you do outside a modeling environment, um, for us, there are things that, that we do outside both the model and the planning environment. Um, so we're looking at things that we haven't already been able to capture in our technical analysis. Um, so we're focusing more on the policy-oriented things, kind of land use-oriented things that, um, that we wouldn't have otherwise modeled or included in our plan. Um, they must be specific. They must be measurable. Obviously, they must be effective. Um, they must make sense for this region. They must be something that we can track over time, um, because if we go down the mitigation measures route, and we believe that we will, um, that would require the Dr. Cog board as part of all this work to adopt a mitigation action plan with these measures, and it would commit the region over time to implement the things that we say that we're going to do in the mitigation action plan um, to really you know, make an honest effort um, to implement the mitigation measures that we identify. So we want something that makes sense for this region, something that we would track at the regional level, um, and something that we would, you know, sort of commit to implementing over time um, for the effectiveness of them from the GHG analysis. So again, a briefing on this for our board tomorrow night, um, but preliminarily we're exploring some, uh, some concepts around parking requirements and zoning related density increases um, and developable and redevelopable land um, near rapid transit stations. Um, that's kind of what we're working on from a technical perspective to see if there's merit of uh, one or more of those becoming mitigation measures that we could actually include in a mitigation action plan. 
So um, just to kind of tie this up, um, some other considerations around this, we believe based on our technical analysis to date, and I wanna be transparent that without mitigation measures, everything else that we've talked about doesn't look like it's gonna be enough to close the GHG emission reduction gap. So we're looking at mitigation measures and the possibility of adopting a mitigation action plan as part of this work. If we don't do that, and we think that we would not meet uh, the GHG emission reduction targets. If we don't meet those targets, the consequence is project eligibility restrictions on federal funds within the Dr. Cog MPO area. There's a couple dynamics to that that I wanna be transparent about. It would affect project eligibility for the 24 to 27 TIP calls, uh, calls three and four, uh, that would occur later this year and in early 2023. And it's not just the federal funds that Dr. Cog administers, it would also affect um, restrict, it would also result in restrictions on CDOT project funding within the 10-year plan, project funding eligibility within the Dr. Cog MPO area, um, because it's federal funds that both agencies administer. So I want to be clear about that. So on that unfortunately negative note, I do want to show you this one more time. Hopefully this makes a little more sense um, of the workflow. Um, again, we've, we've already talked about number one and number two um, in previous meetings. Today, we spent some time on number three. Um, the Dr. Cog board tomorrow night will spend even more time on step number four. Um, and that's really where we're at in this process. So with that, I think that's my last slide and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions for uh, Jacob, uh, uh, Commissioner Stanton. Thank you, Jacob, for an excellent brief. Um, just a question, as we try to get more bus rapid transit and more uh, train, light rail ridership, do we have an update from RTD on what the numbers are in buses and trains? Because I'm concerned, as a devil advocate question, if the ridership doesn't come back and we don't move more people into these transit vehicles, we may not be able, as you said, to meet some of these greenhouse gas uh, plans. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Stanton. I'll let RTD answer in terms of yes. any updates that they have. But in terms of the planning requirement, um, again, we're starting with the 25th RTP as adopted as our baseline. So what we're looking at from a planning perspective and a technical perspective is with that as our baseline, can we actually do even more and do it sooner, um, again, to try and capture those GHG emission reduction benefits sooner. So it's in part a sequencing of, of temporal of you know when we're making some of these investments. Can I ask uh, the CEO RTD of RTD CEO Deborah Johnson to uh, jump in here? Go ahead. Thank you so much, um, Chairman Flynn, and thank you for the question. In relationship to uh, uptick in ridership, as we look at it holistically, uh, ridership has increased over the pre pandemic levels, but it's been slow to do so. Recognizing the adverse impacts from the pandemic, they still are. Um, globally impacting us all. And we have seen ridership numbers fluctuate around the 65% margin. We do see uh, more ridership taking place on the weekends typically as we go forward, uh, but it's been a steady increase. And I'm speaking um, off the top of my head, so I can't give you specific numbers, but broad brushly, we're talking about 65%, recognizing that financial analysts predict that uh, ridership around the globe probably will not resume uh, to the levels prior to the pandemic in the sense that there could be um, a 20% permanent loss of ridership going forward. And those were the latest projections that we have heard from our financial analysts. Thank you very much, Director Johnson. And I really appreciate the honesty on that. If we're gonna be 20% less in the future, Jacob, would it be possible, I'd ask this question about a year ago, to have a plan B so that if we can't get ridership back, that some of your projections as you move forward on greenhouse gas uh, may have to be modified. And I just recommend that we have an alternate plan if possible. Jacob? Sure. Um, yeah, what I'll say, this is not a one-time process for sure. Um, planning is, of course, a snapshot in time. So as we continue to amend and update the plan, work with RTD and all of our partners over time, um, we are continually reassessing everything from transit ridership, land use forecasts that I talked about, other sort of inputs and outputs in our transportation planning process and how they'll affect GHD emissions over time. What I'll say for today is that at least where we sit now, um, I hope one thing you've taken away from my presentation is that it's going to take a collection of strategies. I've used this sort of silly analogy of the layer cake of everything that we're going to have to do um, to meet our emission reduction targets. So this is one piece of it. 
but it's going to take a lot of things even just to get there initially. And then, as you say, we will continue to reassess over time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Director Cook, you're up. Go ahead. Yeah, sort of uh, piggybacking on that, actually. Uh, tomorrow night, on Wednesday night, I should say, um, we're, um, in, we're in a study session looking at uh, the mobility plan for the future. And um, some of the strategies we're considering if we aren't able to realize new uh, revenues or debruce include um, focusing on the regional, uh, the regional backbone, um, focusing on partnerships to help extend services in communities. Um, so the question I'd have is, Jacob, do those strategies include, for example, um, providing some money to communities who might want to partner uh, to enable them to operate their own transit services in partnership with RTD? And or will we focus more money on bike and ped uh, infrastructure that allows last and first mile for a greater distance, that sort of thing? Yeah, um, appreciate the question, a little bit complicated. Let me start with the second part first, which is that I think the short answer is yes. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do in this planning process is understand what strategies are most effective from a GHD reduction perspective. Um, as you heard me talk about these sort of programmatic investments, things like bike pad, uh, complete streets, safety, those sorts of things, you know, are, are really effective. Um, again, it's not a single strategy that's gonna get us there. It's not even two or three strategies that are gonna get us there. It's gonna take a, a constellation of things. But one of the things that we are trying to do in the plan is sort of Rearrange, well, rearrange is the wrong word, but sort of free up some dollars, as I've said, in our fiscal constraint, uh, reallocate some dollars towards doing even more of those investments and doing them sooner um, because we recognize how important they are. In terms of the first part of your question, in terms of local communities operating transit service and um, you know financial allocations to local communities, our long range plan and, and this planning process is not that specific. We're really looking at, um, you know, our long range transportation plan really looks at everything in this region, whether it's, you know, RTD, CDOT, Dr. Cog, local governments, toll highway authorities, whatever it may be, regardless of the type of project and regardless of the type of funding source for those projects, federal, state, local, private, whatever, we bring all of that together in the plan over the 30 years to understand what it's gonna take to maintain, operate, evolve, expand our multimodal transportation system. So making this a long answer, the point I'm getting to is that it's not quite so micro as about giving money to a specific community to do a specific thing. It's more macro in terms of when those things are done or when those dollars are invested, are we capturing in the big picture those investments in our plan? Um, and that's what we're trying to do in our planning process now, particularly from a GHD reduction perspective. Does that answer your question, Director Cook? Can we assume it might happen? I mean, I'm trying to decide whether um, that is a viable approach for us. If, if, um, if we all want to meet these greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction targets, is um, relying on partnerships, which looks like the thing we can do um, in order to extend services beyond what we fiscally, in a fiscally constrained manner can do, is that reasonable? Can we say, yes, let's do that. Let's look to those partnerships. Yeah, and I'll give you an example of that. The regional uh, BRT network that's defined in the plan, you know, those are not quote unquote RTD projects just because they're bus rapid transit. We purposely, when we put the plan together and are carrying this forward, we recognize that some of those regional investments in the plan, like the BRT network, would be things that would take partnerships and would take funding from a variety of sources. So that concept and that approach is absolutely part and parcel of our regional transportation plan for sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Williams, you're up. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> Jacob, did I understand that if we don't meet these goals, that there are financial penalties to us as a region? First question. Funding restrictions, yes. Okay. So given that, um, are we including in our planning, and I say are because I'm including everybody in this meeting, to make that fact known to the community as a whole, that if everybody doesn't get on board and help with this effort, that everybody stands to lose, that um, there are financial losses in our future that everybody's going to bear the burden of. So I'd, I'd just like to see us do more um, sharing of the bad news. 
such as were. Yeah, I would say, Director Williams, we, you know, we've been consistent as Dr. Cog's staff of, um, again, we don't want to scare people, but we want to be transparent. We want to be honest with you all, delivering that message in sort of every meeting and every presentation recently that I've given um, on this topic, because we do want that to be understood. Now, to be clear, we're not trying to scare people. We're trying to do everything we can to meet the emission reduction targets. Um, it's a multi-step process, as I'm sure you've seen from my presentations. We certainly hope to get there, but we do want folks to understand what happens if we can't get there. I just think we ought to take the, you know, the stick concept. We're over the carrot now, apparently, and that maybe we ought to take the stick concept to a broader audience. Um, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stewart, you're up. I think that <clears throat> the issue is not penalties, but rather redirection of funds to try to meet the goal. We want the goal to be attainable. You know, we want the goal to, um, to be able to be met. Um, and I'm gonna ask, I see Rebecca White's on here. I'm wondering if Rebecca wouldn't mind talking just a tiny bit about our greenhouse gas ad hoc committee's efforts in um, what happens when Dr. Cog or North Front Range MPO don't meet the goals that are set for the Front Range. The Front Range is the first region that is required to meet these greenhouse gas goals in 2022, and then the outer areas of the state will follow. Rebecca, are you on there? And would you mind talking a little bit about what happens to the funding, um, not as penalty, but as redirect? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Stewart. I was just starting to put something in the chat um, because it really is an important distinction uh, between uh, restricting versus um, quote unquote taking funds away. And this, the, the compliance regime for this rule is really based on um, restricting or redirecting the dollars. So what, what it provides is that if Dr. Cog, North Front Range, I'll use those two as an example, are unable to comply with the greenhouse gas standard, then uh, multimodal options fund dollars, CMAC dollars, which you heard a bit about today, and the STBG surface treatment block grant dollars must be spent um, on projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that doesn't mean um, they're, you know, they can't, uh, they're fully restricted. It's just that they have to be focused on projects we know make a difference and move us in the direction we need to go. By the same token, CDOT's 10 year plan dollars in those two regions um, must also be uh, focused on projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that, that is a, the compliance regime set up for the first of us out of the gate. Um, and then the other three MPOs around the state come into the standard um, within the next few years. Does that help? Is that what you're looking for, Commissioner Stewart? Yes, thank you. Uh, I might also say um, that we internally have have tweaked um, the policy directive and um, the mitigation appendices to accommodate requests from Dr. Coggin from North Front Range MPO because our task from the legislature is to put this project, this this analysis, evaluation, and attainment to practice, and it's um, it, it's new to us. We're we're trying to, as a group, um, approve a policy that is not punitive but is um, goal oriented. And so, I think you'll see that we'll try to be flexible and nimble um, as we move forward in this first effort. It is the first effort. Uh, so I think, uh, Rebecca, without going into the complexities of what we've been discussing um, for the last six or eight months, however many the ad hoc committee has been on, um, I think that's a good answer, but maybe you could be available if there's follow-up questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stanton? Yes, I just want to follow up on uh, Director Stewart and Rebecca White's comments about being nimble and reminding that the Transportation Commission put in that A, the rule could be opened up in the future, B, that the policy directive, if regional uh, groups uh, want to make additional mediation proposals, uh, that basically it's a living document and that Rebecca White's and, and uh, Director uh, 
that have been involved in this, the ad hoc committee have been very flexible in our on the receive mode. So while we're, in fact, we're going to be passing another amendment to the PD on Thursday and probably another one after that. So this, this thing is living and moving. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, thank you, Jacob, very much and for that. Thank very, you, Mr. Chair. For that very depressing uh, outlook. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next up is an informational briefing on the regional Complete Streets Network prioritization uh, from Emily Kleinfelter. And I think I saw Emily in the list. And there she is. Thank you. Take it away. I guess I should unmute myself as well. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Emily Kleinfelter. I'm the Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner here with Dr. Cog. Um, I think this is maybe my first time actually presenting to you all. So. Hello, um, and I'm gonna be talking to you all about the Complete Streets Prioritization Analysis work that we've been doing. Um, and just to remind you, uh, last year, the board did adopt the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit, um, which provides guidance for local jurisdictions so that they can adopt Complete Streets approaches, um, You know, which if you're not familiar with what a Complete Streets approach is, it's, a complete, it's an approach where it's making a balanced mode of transportation for everyone including walking and biking, transit, um, and of course, driving. And so this toolkit was intended to support the 2050 Metro Vision RTP um, and also encourage cross-jurisdictional collaboration um, in, order, in order to encourage more building out of complete trees across the Denver region. And with the um, passing, oh, and so one other thing that we did have, a really new innovative tool that we came out of from that toolkit was this complete street story map that I wanted to remind folks that we do have as a really fantastic resource. Um, this is taking that plan and putting it into a more kind of interactive um, tool for you to use. And, and this map is there for you to explore around in. And I highly encourage you to check that out. Um, and so what we're gonna be talking about today is the fact that the bipartisan infrastructure law required the development of a complete streets prioritization plan, um, which was asking uh, folks to identify a specific list um, of complete streets projects that would be focusing on improving safety and mobility um, or accessibility of the street. And so Dr. Cog uh, already had a contract with Tool Design Group, and we extended that contract for the um, toolkit. And so we extended that for this prioritization analysis work. And in doing so, um, this, this work used a lot of the, or well, several really of Dr. Cog's previous planning initiatives um, that we've done over the years to work to create basically a, a single GIS layer um, or, or a, a map layer, if, if you will, um, that we then used to, to put together basically a calculation or a formula that helped us identify um, a score for all of the complete streets or all of the networks of the, throughout the Dr. Cog region of streets. Um, and then ultimately we're gonna use that to prioritize, prioritize um, our networks to then identify places that could use safety improvements for mobility um, and accessibility as well, just like the, the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, directs. So I mentioned those planning initiatives and I think those are um, really important for us to just take a moment to, to touch on. I won't list them all out to you here, but you, you can see them all um, and I'll, I'll show them to you in the map as well. But we have, of course have the um, RTP we have the Complete Streets Toolkit and another one definitely to take that we took um, high into account is the Regional Vision Zero um, Action Plan that we put together and we, we highly uh, valued if a corridor was um, on a critical corridor of the high injury network. Um, and so again, these are all different um, basically sources of data that we use to do our prioritization analysis. Um, and then we worked with Tool to uh, map the results, which it looks like not much here, which is, I guess, kind of the point. But um, let me see if I can move the screen sharing thing out of the way. OK, so what I want to show you here is the results of the prioritization analysis. Prioritization analysis. It's a hard word to say. Um, and this is the Dr. Cog region, all of our street network with the analysis with no filter. Um, this is just every score all the way from if it had a score of potentially zero, which definitely didn't happen, all the way up to our highest score, I think of 28 or 29. 
Um, and if it has a high score, it means that it was, um, it, it was on a BRT network. It, had, uh, it was in the environmental justice area. It was on a critical corridor. It was in a short, uh, short trip opportunity zone, a pedestrian focus area. Like it was hitting all of these important criteria where we knew that it was an important place for us to focus on improving mobility and accessibility and definitely safety. And so this is what the Dr. Cog um, street network looks like with those scores. But because this is a prioritization analysis, we obviously want to, um, we want to kind of narrow it down and prior to prioritizing. So then we put in a filter. And this is with the scores um, at 15, if it has a score of 15 and above. And then I can take that down, I think. And this is 20 and above. And then finally, this is a score of 23 and above. And this you'll see really narrows it down to some of these really critical corridors basically, um, or, or hotspots um, of where we're gonna start focusing on, on investments. Um, these are places that we, um, we have the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant that the bipartisan infrastructure law also came out with. And so, um, we think that this is a great place for us to start to identify um, a location for investment. We also hope this is a tool that um, jurisdictions will use when they're applying for TIP funding, that they can um, know where they need to put an in investment in their, in their area, and also use it as a tool to back up their argument to show, um, as you can see, if I turn on this layers here, you'll be able to see all of these other um, data layers that I was help, uh, explaining, this is how we got to the prioritization analysis. So you can kind of play around on this map here, which we will make publicly available soon. Um, but it's, I'm hoping will be a great tool for everyone across the Dr. Cog region to, to help identify um, locations that are due to have a complete street retrofit. And so, um, as I just mentioned, that's, that's what we're hoping this will do is um, help help uh, member governments use this to identify priority projects um, that are ideal candidates for funding. And so with that, um, I'll take any questions. Uh, thank you, Emily. Do we have questions from any folks? I, uh, let me kick it off, Emily, just ask on the, uh, I noticed that on, as you uh, went up in the scores, you know, 23 and above, the quarters had gaps in them. And so what, what were the criteria that uh, dictated, or that, not dictate, but resulted in say, let me zoom in like on Federal Boulevard uh, mm -hmm. from all the way up north to south, there's little gaps here and there. Well, what accounts for that? So we actually are working on something uh, that, like I said, this is not public yet because yeah. um, it's, a, it's kind of a finicky thing with, with our street data that it can um, have these little gaps to it. And so we're working on cleaning it up on the back end so that those gaps are not occurring if, you know, if it is having all pretty much the same score. The only reason that a gap would potentially occur would be if it's um, across different jurisdictions. And so mm -hmm. potentially um, there might be something happening there when it's a data thing that I promise um, our GIS team would answer much more clearly, but um, I do know that the final result when we have it out in public will will have those gaps cleaned up. Okay, I, I was actually thinking that uh, that the gaps are should be there because of some uh, data point that is uh, uh, fulfilled or not fulfilled depending on what segment of federal or Colfax or Wadsworth uh, you might be in. Uh, yes. Maybe the, the investments are not uh, as crucial in those those locations, and having those gaps actually, from my point of view, would help me focus resources where they're most needed. Is that is that basically yes. what, what I'm looking at here? Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I, I guess we. I was more mentioning. I don't know if you can see. There's very very minuscule gaps oh, that we've yeah. really been working on on the data side to make sure that those little small gaps, but but the larger gaps that, like you said, um, would maybe uh, insinuate or yeah would maybe hopefully tell us that that's maybe an area we would put less uh, focus on. Certainly. All right, other questions? I don't see any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. I yeah, appreciate that. The, uh, that is uh, it for our informational briefings.
uh, do we have um, administrative, uh, I'm sorry, member comment and other matters? Uh, we have a report from CDOT. Uh, Rebecca, are you uh, prepared to give us a report on, from CDOT? Uh, thank you, Chair. I, you know, I'd forgotten that we uh, had this new agenda item. I think we had, this was discussed at the last RTC meeting. Um, okay. You know, the, the greenhouse gas work is obviously front and center for our agency, as it is for Dr. Cog, with the companion um, effort to update the 10-year plan. So that is our, our main focus for the summertime for CDOT, um, in addition to preparing for the numerous grant announcements that seem to keep streaming from the FHWA. Uh, the one that's up right now is focused on byways. Um, and we have more scenic byways in Colorado than any other state in the nation. And we're looking forward to some, submitting some grants on that. Um, I would also defer to the several commissioners we have on this meeting, as well as Jessica Mickelbus to see if they want to add anything from the CDOT perspective. Great. Anything else? Thank you. Thanks. Um, our, our Commissioner Stewart. Okay, so I'll just say um, on the agenda for this week, um, the I-270 critical bridge replacements project alternative delivery recommendation, the 270 project is one that's been on the 10 year list and is really important to the North Denver, Adams County region. And um, we're looking at doing the delivery a little bit differently and putting in the bridges prior to the, the um, um, repair and um, expansion of the road. So that's on our agenda as well. And um, it looks like we have a pretty packed agenda for this, this month. Um, and as uh, Vice Chair Stanton talked about, we will have updates to the greenhouse gas um, policy and mitigation plan. And we can anticipate that happening in the next couple of meetings as we uh, do some, sometimes just some tweaking of language and some wordsmithing and sometimes some uh, further analysis that changes a few of the ratios. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Commissioner Stanton. Thank you. I wanted to follow on what uh, Director Stewart just said. Uh, just want to let everybody know that the ad hoc committee is led by Commissioner Hickey of Colorado Springs, um, Karen Stewart um, in Adams Broomfield area, and also Barbara Vasquez from Walden. So these are the key commissioners who will continue to be the ones working with Rebecca White's uh, environmental management team and Herman Stockinger. So just wanted you all to have their points of contact. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Williams. I just want to remind everybody that before we see each other again, it is bike to work day coming up shortly. And so we should all be riding our bikes to our next virtual meeting. Well, I'll ride my virtual bike to my next virtual meeting. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda actually is an uh, update from uh, RTD and uh, I see uh, uh, Bill Van Meter here. Uh, is uh, Deborah Johnson still? Oh, there she is. Okay. I have too many names on my screen. Uh, <laughs> CEO Johnson. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I did see the chairman of our board's hand go up, so I will yield the floor to members of the board um, if they would like to make comments before I provide an update in addition to Mr. Van Meter. Okay. I don't see any other hands up yet. Are any of the RTD board members here? Uh, okay. Uh, Director Busek. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'll just start briefly. And uh, Director Cook alluded to this in her comments tomorrow night. Uh, the the yeah. our, our committee is going to be taking a look at the reimagined RTD progress and process. Uh, it's getting to its point of finalization. Uh, it will come before the board in July for uh, final approval. Uh, anybody that can make it to the meeting tomorrow night, I would recommend doing so. Uh, listening to the comments. Um, uh, also alluded to earlier in comments were the impacts of Tabor on our future budgeting process. Um, and we have some discussion going on about debrucing. I appointed an ad hoc committee to explore uh, that possibility and they're continuing to do that work. Director Cook is on that uh, committee as well. Um, so that should be an interesting discussion uh, moving forward. 
uh, with the reimagined process that has been in the works for uh, several years now, and hopefully coming to a, a partial conclusion when we talk about the system optimization plan as we move forward. So um, that's, uh, we also have uh, August of this year is going to be zero fare August on RTD. So all of RTD services will be zero fare. Um, I make sure to say zero fare because our general manager CEO uh, would, would hit me if I said free fares because nothing is free. So uh, zero fares all of August, uh, more to come on that. You, we will be getting on media packets. There'll be a link on our website, I believe, or a separate website for, for the media information uh, promoting the zero fare August. And hopefully uh, that can be a success for RTD. Uh, that's all I have. If any other directors have any comments they'd like to make, or, or otherwise I'll, Turn it back to GM CEO Johnson. Thanks. Any other directors? Seeing none, CEO Johnson, you're up. Yes, thank you so much, um, uh -huh. Chair Flynn, and thank you so much, uh, Chair Busick. Um, just to elaborate a little bit on what the chairman said as relates to our Zero Fair program, Zero Fair for Better Air for August, information will be forthcoming. Um, uh, what we uh, are doing currently. Um, reaching out, working with the Metro Mayor's Caucus, as well as with TMOs um, and TMAs and a myriad of different entities. We have meetings that are scheduled. What we endeavor to do is to brief our board on June 28th about the partnership opportunities and set up um, a partner portal where uh, entities that are interested in sharing information to help promote. It will be a conduit in which they can leverage that going forward as we look to, <clears throat> excuse me, all of a sudden I can't speak, look to leverage graphics and things of the like. So wanted to ensure that we put that out there. So the week of June 28th, uh, we expect to release information after we have the opportunity to brief our board on the path forward as we work on this in earnest. Um, additionally, what we're doing as well, we um, are going to enter into um, an intergovernmental agreement with the Colorado Energy Office um, as we look to uh, uh, take advantage of the grant funding that's available that was effectuated through Senate Bill 22180. The other item I'd just like to touch upon quickly is our fair study and equity analysis. Um, as many of you know that this is an undertaking uh, that commenced in the beginning of this year with a lot of legwork being done in the summer and fall of 2021. Uh, we have had great engagement and interaction uh, thus far with our first round in which we have leveraged uh, ample participation from a diverse array of uh, constituencies. We have placed information in Spanish, Vietnamese, uh, Chinese, and of course, I forgot the last one. Um, as we've gone forward and we've seen just tremendous input especially as we've leveraged CBOs, community-based organizations. Um, so that's very high level. We will be providing a briefing to the board uh, this evening being June 14th at 5.30 as it relates to the fair study and equity analysis and uh, where we are. And I will like to yield the floor to Mr. Van Meter for any additional uh, comments and reports he would like to give. So thank you very much, Chair Flynn. Certainly, Bill, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to highlight a couple more points regarding the Reimagine RTD study session tomorrow night, which Chair Busick and Director Cook both have um, given a good sneak preview about. And so just to reiterate Chair Busick's um, point, the system optimization plan, the draft final of that will be released tomorrow evening following that board meeting and the anticipation is board action on that in the July timeframe. So that's the near term through 2027 plan for RTD. Um, the uh, uh, long-term plan, the mobility plan for the future is looking at some financial scenarios, all of which um, indicate a real substantial gap between public and stakeholder expectations in the long term over what RTD can provide. So the board is going to have an interesting discussion, I think, um, tomorrow evening at the study session, looking at opportunities and constraints, partnership opportunities, um, to Director Cook's earlier um, question and point, 
um, with local jurisdictions, should RTD be focusing on the regional aspect and providing a regional backbone and transit services. A number of recommendations from the consultant team as to how to um, define RTD's future um, path forward and um, prioritize um, actions and um, policy direction for the agency. And so that's my attempt, a little bit more of a sneak preview. And uh, that's where I'll be tomorrow night instead of at uh, the Dr. Cog board meeting. So apologies in advance to those um, Dr. Cog representatives in attendance here, but I will have staff um, there tomorrow evening. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will preemptively mark you as absent for tomorrow, Bill. <laughs> uh, I have a quick question, uh, CEO Johnson. Uh, we heard from uh, during an earlier presentation how uh, travel time, travel periods, the peak periods are kind of flattening out on the highways and on the road network. Are you seeing that uh, on transit also? Are you seeing less of a peak and more of a spread throughout the day? Yes, thank you very much, Chairman Flynn. And I believe Director Williams identified it as the camel. Right. Huh? You know, and right. we are seeing that because in relationship to having various options uh, to work and so forth, we see people taking advantage of transit at different times during the day. And this is not just, you know, uh, something here in Colorado, as I speak with my peers around the country, we're seeing the same things going mm -hmm. forward um, in, in other parts. So um, we've been tracking that and, um, you know, who's to say if it's here to stay, but it seems as if it's been pretty consistent going forward. So it's not the typical rush hours like we used to see on the shoulders. Yeah, great. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, other matters uh, from any other member? Uh, anyone have any comments they wanna raise before the committee before we leave? I don't see any. So uh, our next meeting is July 19th next month. And with no other business before the uh, RTC, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Take care. Thank you, Thanks. Chair. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.